At the age of eight, Asenath Ducott went by the nickname Sini, lived on Malvern Road in Columbus, Ohio, and attended Barrington Elementary School. Sini would normally arrive home from school at 4 p.m., but on June 3, 1980, she never arrived. Her home was 12 blocks, or about one mile from the school. By 4.34 p.m., when Sini still had not shown up, her parents reported her missing. Tragically, just a few hours later, at 7.30 p.m., her body was found in a shallow stream at the mouth of a ditch less than a thousand feet from her home in the First Community Village, a residential community in Upper Arlington. Her cause of death was strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. Her head injury was caused by a 20-pound limestone rock that was found at the crime scene. However, investigators believed she was abducted and murdered at a location other than where she was discovered. A witness saw a red bicycle leaning against bushes a short distance from where police said she was first attacked, and that same bicycle description will come into play again soon. Over the years, investigators identified more than a dozen persons of interest and conducted more than a thousand interviews. In 2019, a community-based group was created online titled The Long Walk Home, the Asenath Ducott Project, consisting of local kids who remembered Sini's murder. The group regularly sleuthed around the case, claiming they had their eyes on a man named Brent L. Strutner for some time. In fact, in 2008, the DNA from her autopsy led them to Strutner, who would have been 20 at the time of the murder. He lived locally and graduated from Upper Arlington High School in 1979. However, he took his own life in Columbus, Ohio in 1984 at the age of 24. Even though they had linked Strutner to the crime scene, the police didn't want to release information publicly until they were certain they had answers. The latest investigator on the case stated that Strutner was a suspect long before they could identify him. The group, who had been working on her case, said it is reasonable to conclude Strutner did not act alone. According to police, one of Strutner's known associates was also looked at for Sini's murder. Police stated that around the time of her murder, other jurisdictions, including Columbus and the Ohio State University, were experiencing various attacks on young females. This included an attempt to abduct a young girl on Henderson Road only months after Sini's murder by one of Strutner's known associates, Robert Chris Winchester. While Winchester was found guilty and served prison time for the crime, the police division could never discover sufficient evidence to link him to Sini's murder. Police stated they re-examined every piece of DNA evidence taken from Sini's post-mortem examination, but there was no additional physical evidence that could connect another individual to the crime. Less than a month before Sini was murdered, on May 7, 1980, at about 3.30 p.m., a nine-year-old girl and her classmate were walking home from a school bus stop at Canterbury Lane after just finishing their day at Tremont Elementary School. A witness saw a man on a bicycle following the two girls and passing by them at least twice. The girls split up, and while passing some bushes in the yard, the girl told police she was grabbed from behind by a man. The man choked her when she tried to scream, and she lost consciousness. When the child awoke, her face had been battered, and she had been moved several hundred feet to a secluded area and had possibly been sexually assaulted. This incident and the one involving Sini were only about two miles apart. Police have always believed the same man committed both of these crimes. Thankfully, for an unknown reason, the assailant fled, and the girl suffered no further harm. She didn't see his face during the attack, but witnesses described the man on the bike as between 15 and 20 years of age, thin, with straight black hair and a dark complexion. Later, the description was changed to a white male, 16 to 20 years old, 180 to 200 pounds, black hair with a pale complexion. Finally, in August of 2022, the city of Upper Arlington's police chief, Steve Farmer, announced that the police division solved the case using DNA technology advancements. 
They officially identified Brent Strutner as the suspect in the case, closing the case after 42 years. However, the community group invested in her case believes that Strutner didn't act alone and will continue to look into the involvement of a second suspect. On April 20, 1977, around 4.30 a.m., 65-year-old Harriet Carr, who lived at 940 North Olney Street in Indianapolis, Indiana, noticed her garage door was slightly ajar and went to investigate. She walked into the garage to find her husband, 62-year-old Melvin Ted Carr, dead on the floor. As if that wasn't enough of a shock, in the open trunk of their car, Harriet saw three bodies, a woman, a teenage girl, and a very young boy. Harriet started screaming and took off running away from the garage, and neighbors who heard the commotion called the police. It seemed that her husband had collapsed while trying to run a vacuum cleaner hose from the car's tailpipe to its trunk. The three bodies in the trunk were identified as 24-year-old Karen Mills, her two-year-old son Robert, and a 17-year-old girl named Sandra Harris. Autopsies found that all four had died from carbon monoxide poisoning, and it was determined that both Karen and Sandra had been sexually assaulted. Police located a loaded 25 caliber revolver in Carr's pocket and a handkerchief he had likely used in an attempt not to inhale the carbon monoxide. At the time, Harriet allegedly had no idea that her husband of many years was a serial killer. Carr had abducted the three victims, sexually assaulted the two females, then ordered them into the trunk at gunpoint. He then drove his car into the garage and inserted one end of the hose into the tailpipe and the other into the trunk. Finally, he closed and locked the trunk and left his victims to die. Deep scratch marks on the inside of the trunk told investigators that the two women had fought to escape, breaking their fingernails in the process. It's thought that he died when he opened the car's trunk to either check on the victims or begin disposing of their bodies. But then he ironically inhaled too much carbon monoxide, collapsed, and died on the floor of his garage, ending his decades of harming and murdering innocent victims. According to people who knew Carr, he had a temper, especially with women. In 1942, he joined the military, and while stationed in Virginia, he married his second wife, Benny French. And just like his first marriage, it didn't last very long. In 1943, he was discharged from the military and returned home to Ohio after only a year in the service. He began work as a craftsman and married his third wife, Harriet. In early 1945, a woman named Clara Esser hired him to build her a house, but after giving him almost $3,000 and seeing nothing being built, she had him arrested. In early 1947, Carr was indicted on charges of receiving property under false pretenses. During the trial, it was learned that Carr had been on the FBI's radar for some time. He had been arrested several times for stealing vehicles, carrying concealed weapons, and writing bad checks as far away as California. He was found guilty of the charges, but the judge granted him bond, allowing him to be a free man while the investigation continued. During those eight months, he traveled extensively, leaving his wife Harriet back home in Ohio. In the fall of 1947, Carr was arrested in Kimball, Nebraska after he kidnapped two hitchhikers, a husband and a wife named Robert and Betty Carney. They told police that after being picked up by Carr in a brand new Cadillac that was pulling a trailer, he asked them if they would be interested in working for him at a hunting lodge he claimed to own in Idaho. He also told them his name was John Marshall, the same name he used to write bad checks years before. After agreeing to work for him, the couple said things went fine for a few days. He bought them food, gave them blankets to sleep with, and chatted with them the entire ride. But on the third morning, as they reached a secluded road, he suddenly became extremely angry and pulled a gun from under his seat. He stopped the car along a secluded road and ordered the couple from the car at gunpoint. 
He then handcuffed Robert to the trailer hitch and violently sexually assaulted Betty. He struck Robert and Betty in the face multiple times with the gun, leaving them bleeding and bruised. Eventually, Carr let the couple go and drove away. The couple flagged down a passing motorist who took them to the police station. They explained what happened, and a short time later, Carr was arrested for rape and kidnapping. Shockingly, he was once again granted a bond and then fled the state and headed back home to Ohio. Later, Carr and his wife fled Ohio and headed to Indiana. In March of 1948, the Ohio judge who had granted Carr the bond and continuances decided to seek money from a man named Jack Abrams, who had signed his $2,000 bond. After the state had spent considerable time and money working on the case against Carr, Jack was charged only $65, and a warrant was issued for Carr. After settling down in Indiana, Carr continued to find work as a carpenter and also worked for his father at his service station. That's where he met a woman named Lois Williams, and the pair got to know one another. It's unclear what year they met, but in February of 1967, it was discovered that Lois and her 17-year-old daughter Karen had gone missing. Lois's father called the police and asked them to perform a welfare check. Police noted that Lois's house was spotless and nothing appeared to have been taken, not even Lois or Karen's winter coat, despite the freezing temperatures outside. As a result, they were reported missing. On the evening Lois was last seen, a neighbor and co-worker of cars, Calvin Campbell, witnessed Lois and Karen leave the gas station in his car. Hours later, he returned angry, telling Calvin that he was mad at Lois and said she had gone into a bar and refused to come out. The following morning, Carr's dad came across the street, yelling that his son had been beaten up and robbed. Calvin found a bloody car on the ground, and he told Calvin that someone had mugged him outside of the service station, but insisted Calvin not call the police. Calvin went inside to check if anything had been stolen from the business, but nothing was missing. But the vehicle that Carr was driving the night before was on a lift. It had been cleaned with a pressure washer inside and out, with a particular focus on the trunk. Calvin quit his job at the service station after that. His wife, Maureen, believes she too was almost a victim of Carr's. She said Carr informed her he was going to the hospital one night because he was having trouble breathing. Later that night, while Calvin was working his new job as a janitor, Carr called her and asked if she would check if he had left the garage door open, claiming he was worried someone might try to steal his tools. But Maureen didn't go because she had been told about Carr's violent tendencies. It was later discovered that Carr had definitely been at the hospital that evening, but a nurse discovered he had vanished from his room, never bothering to check out. This was hours before his phone call to Maureen. A neighbor reported seeing his car parked a block away, so it's likely he had plans to attack Maureen that night. Maureen believed that he used the landline in his garage to call her and believes he had plans to kidnap her. Early into the disappearance of Lois and Karen, police searched Carr's garage and found personal papers belonging to Lois in a suitcase. Lois's watch was also discovered in the gas station's garage. Still, no other evidence was found, and police didn't believe they had enough to charge him with the crime. In early 1971, he was convicted of defrauding an elderly blind woman from her life savings. After giving Carr her power of attorney, he left the disabled 81-year-old widow with only $30 in her savings account. Carr was also known to groom children and was suspected of forcing a 10-year-old girl to commit an abnormal sex act, but he was never charged with the crime. Later that same year, Carr received five years in jail after he took a 14-year-old girl named Joyce Kinley to Mexico for immoral purposes. Carr had opened a store selling specialty pottery and ceramics from Mexico. His landlord, a man named Roy Henley, who was also the landlord of the home Joyce's family lived in, suggested that Carr take Joyce on a trip to Mexico to employ her as his assistant. Her mother, Maureen, agreed, 
and the two spent three weeks in Mexico. Joyce called her mother daily, telling her Carr was mistreating her. Upon their return, her mother and Roy demanded Carr give them $500, and they would not report what had happened. Shortly after, Maureen signed over her parental rights to Carr with the promise that he would pay for Joyce's schooling, basically selling her daughter to a serial rapist and serial killer. Roy also suggested that Carr marry Joyce in Mexico to prevent further issues. Maureen agreed and accompanied her young daughter and Carr to Mexico, where they married. Upon their return to the U.S., Carr was stopped at the border in Texas and questioned about the young girl. He was later arrested and sent back to Indiana, where he received his sentence of five years. Maureen would later testify she had lied about Carr's abuse towards Joyce and was merely in cahoots with Roy to extort money from him. Neither Roy nor Maureen was arrested or charged with any crimes. While Carr was in prison for the crime, correctional officers discovered several hand-drawn maps of the interior of both the older woman's and the 14-year-old girl's homes. The maps also included Carr's plans to kill them. He also put two hits on a detective and an FBI agent. Carr was released after serving only three of his five-year sentence. After the bodies were discovered in his trunk, the investigation into Lois and Karen's disappearance resumed. Police began excavating his yard and his basement and garage floor, where fresh patches of cement were found. Unfortunately, investigators were unable to locate Lois or Karen's remains, although some investigators believe they were not allowed adequate time to search the property fully. However, Carr was well known as an excellent craftsman and had completely remodeled his basement shortly after Lois and Karen had disappeared. Lois's father had believed for quite some time that Carr was responsible for their disappearances. Unfortunately, he passed away without getting closure, and Lois and Karen's remains have never been found. Some investigators believe the pair's remains are inside the house at 940 North Olney in Indianapolis, perhaps in a wall. If that is the case, their bodies remain behind those walls and the home still stands today. After Carr's death, more crimes he had committed came to light and more victims emerged with much more horrific stories. One of those victims was a seven-year-old girl who identified Carr from his picture in the newspaper as the man who had sodomized her in a park in 1975. Three girls aged 11, 13, and 14 from Indiana said Carr was the man who abducted them in 1975 as they were walking to an amusement park. They said he forced them into his car at gunpoint and then took them to a secluded field he then sexually assaulted the youngest girl and left all three for dead in a cornfield after he thought he killed them with a knife. The two older girls managed to crawl through the field to the edge of a road where they were spotted by a passing motorist who got them help. All three of the girls miraculously survived the attack. It's unclear how many more victims there were or how many more he would have had if this idiot hadn't thankfully offed himself. At the age of 24, Michael Anthony Temple Jr. lived in Odenton, Maryland. On February 2, 2010, Michael and his girlfriend were inside a home in the 500 block of Williamsburg Lane in Odenton when two masked men entered. A fight broke out and one of the men shot Michael twice, once in the leg and once in his spine. The injuries left him a quadriplegic, forced to use a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Michael's parents, Cynthia and Michael Sr., watched him suffer through the pain for five years before he died from his injuries in June 2015. Michael fought back by stabbing one of the intruders, leaving him injured, dripping blood, one of the few clues that would eventually help solve the case. When Michael died, autopsy results showed his injuries during the attack were the cause of his death, changing the case from an assault to murder. And that is when cold case investigators reached out to Parabon Nanolabs for help. 
taking the suspect's DNA from the crime, their technology was used to create a phenotype report and a snapshot of the suspect's DNA. Unfortunately, no one came forward to identify the suspect from the picture. So in 2018, detectives explored the use of genetic genealogy. The genealogy research produced a match and Parabon alerted detectives that Fred Frampton was likely their suspect. Detectives began surveilling Frampton and secretly took multiple DNA samples from him, including a coffee cup and cigarette butt he had tossed on the ground. Those DNA samples were given to Parabon, who matched them with the DNA left at the scene of the shooting. After identifying 32-year-old Fred Frampton as one suspect, they were able to identify the other suspect as Jonathan Ludwig. Michael's dad says it wasn't long after the attack that the two men started working with him at a construction business in town, sometimes working directly with one another on certain jobs. Michael's dad is appalled the two men knowingly worked with him after shooting his son. On November 1, 2018, Frampton was arrested for murder in his hometown of Glen Burnie, Maryland. Upon searching Frampton's home, police would find a handgun that was tied to the original crime scene. After being questioned by detectives, Frampton confessed to the murder and home invasion and has since pleaded guilty to one count of first-degree murder. As police zeroed in on Ludwig, he would die from an overdose. Investigations revealed that before 9 p.m., the two so-called men entered the home and pistol-whipped one man, Donald Gagnon, knocking him to the floor. Frampton pointed a gun at Donald while Ludwig duct-taped his hands behind his back, his ankles together, covered his mouth, and then stole his wallet. The two entered the basement and found Michael, Margaret Ridgely, and Kelly Skarwacki. Frampton ordered the three to the floor and demanded money, but Michael fought back. Margaret fought with Ludwig and was struck on the head. Michael fought with Frampton and ended up in the laundry room where Frampton shot him twice. Police recovered multiple shell casings, a four-inch blade, and a partial projectile from the scene. Also, the two criminals took over $2,000 from the home. Michael's dad says he spends hours just sitting and talking to his son at his gravesite, trying to keep it together. His mother, Cynthia, died after years of grief, and his father wishes she would have been alive to see the case solved. Nancy Anderson had nine siblings. In late 1971, she moved to Hawaii after graduating high school in Bay City, Michigan, and began working at McDonald's at the age of 19. She and her roommate, 18-year-old Judy Spooner, lived in a small apartment at 2222 Aloha Drive in Waikiki, Hawaii. On January 7, 1972, two months after moving to Waikiki, her roommate Judy came home at 2.30 p.m. and found Nancy visiting with two male silverware salesmen. Judy took a nap and thought she heard a scream at about 4.15 p.m., but waited until about 5 p.m. to check on Nancy. When she finally went to check on her, she found Nancy lying on her back in a pool of blood on the floor of her room stabbed to death in an extreme overkill. While Honolulu police didn't have a suspect, they were at least able to recover DNA from a blood-stained towel in the apartment. They questioned the door-to-door knife salespeople, as well as her former boyfriends and the property manager of her apartment building. The salespeople volunteered their fingerprints, which were not matches, and passed polygraph tests. Unfortunately, the other suspects proved to be dead ends as well. At the time of the incident, homicide detectives could not develop viable leads and the case went cold. That is, until 50 years later, in December 2021, when a solid tip came in that pointed to Tudor Chirilla being a possible suspect. Chirilla was an attorney who lived in Honolulu in the 1970s and was a graduate assistant at the University of Hawaii, located near Nancy's apartment at the time of her death. 
Using DNA found during the investigation, Parabon created trait predictions for a person of interest using DNA preserved from the crime scene. Those predictions were then used to make a snapshot composite of the suspect. Police confirmed that he was a prime suspect after obtaining a DNA sample from his son, John Chirilla, of Newport Beach, California. The sample identified the younger Chirilla as the biological child of the person whose DNA was found at the crime scene. Reno police executed a search warrant and collected a DNA sample directly from 77-year-old Tudor Chirilla at his Reno apartment. Two days later, on September 8th, Chirilla attempted suicide, and a few days after that, he was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Tudor Chirilla is a retired, longtime attorney in Reno, Carson City, and the Lake Tahoe area. He was also a former Nevada Deputy Attorney General tied to the infamous Mustang Ranch brothel. The murder charge is not his first run-in with the law outside his profession. In a 1998 federal indictment, U.S. prosecutors in Reno identified him as the former president of Age Corp Company, who served as a front for the Nevada brothel boss Joe Conforte. The indictment accused Conforte and others of being part of an elaborate conspiracy to defraud the government in bankruptcy proceedings when the Mustang Ranch brothel east of Reno was seized by the IRS, sold for back taxes in 1990, and illegally repurchased by Conforte and his cohorts. The government claimed Conforte hid his assets during bankruptcy proceedings to cheat the government and buy back the legal brothel under the hidden ownership of Age Corp. Chirilla testified as a government witness and acknowledged that he was aware the corporation was owned and controlled by Conforte, who disappeared, likely to South America, when the case went to trial in 1999. Nancy was killed in 1972, and Chirilla sat for the bar in Nevada and became licensed there in 1978. So basically, he murdered her, went on about his life, went to law school, and worked as an attorney until he retired in 2015. At the age of 38, Barbara Leon Brown was living in Kingman, Arizona. On June 26, 1997, her husband reported her missing. On July 1, 1997, her body was found in a thicket of bushes in Section 30, an undeveloped area near Rotary Park along the Colorado River in Bullhead City, Arizona, about 50 miles southeast of Las Vegas. An autopsy concluded that she had suffered injuries from blunt force trauma, including multiple skull fractures. The case would go unsolved for the next 17 years until a man with a guilty conscience and paranoia confessed to her murder. In June 2014, 55-year-old Matthew Gibson drove 1,800 miles from Villas, North Carolina to Winslow, Arizona to confess to the crime. Gibson told investigators that he killed her during an argument inside his home when she refused to leave between 1994 and 1997 and said he had to get it off his chest. He told police he had met the victim one night and the two returned to his trailer. He found her loud and obnoxious and she refused to leave and an argument ensued. He then beat her to death with a large flashlight He put her body in the trunk of his car and dumped it in a park, then tossed the flashlight on a road heading toward Las Vegas. A few months later, he moved from Bullhead City. Authorities went through cold case murders in that city during that time using the description and details he gave them and discovered that the victim he described was indeed Barbara. He said he used to be addicted to meth and cocaine but found religion and sobered up but mostly he became suspicious after he began receiving text messages and voicemails from Walmart telling him that Anita Townsend's prescription was ready for pickup. Gibson did not know the name of the woman he killed, so he concluded that Anita Townsend must have been the victim and that someone was playing games with him. When he was sent an envelope containing an ad from Walmart but no return label, he believed someone had put a contract on his head. 
Gibson was never even on the radar of investigators. In fact, despite being a former drug addict, Gibson had never even had any run-ins with the law, not even a traffic ticket. He said he never meant to hurt anyone and has been remorseful since it happened. Nevertheless, Gibson was charged with second-degree murder but pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to ten and a half years in prison. 